Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here on short notice. Uh, obviously, there's been a terrible incident that's happened in our city this morning. Our city's 145th homicide victim of the year. Let me repeat that. 145th homicide of the year was a 16-year-old student waiting at a bus stop, a school bus stop. What should be a sacred space uh, in our community, a safe space where there should be every expectation of safety and security. This is a traumatic uh, tragedy that impacts not just that space, but every school bus stop and every family that thinks about the safety of these stops in our city. That sacred space was violated this rainy Wednesday morning by gunfire. And a teen who should be in school today will not be there and will never be there again. Two other students also waiting at the bus stop were shot. As mayor of Louisville, it's my job to shepherd our city through the best of times, the worst of times, and the times in between. And clearly the loss of another child to meaningless violence is one of the worst of times. As a father and a grandfather, this breaks my heart. And even the most caring words seem inadequate in offering solace to a family suffering such irreplaceable loss. I pray that this child's family and friends know the people of Louisville carry them in their hearts in their time of great sorrow. And while that's not enough, I hope that offers some comfort. To the rest of the community, and specifically to those committing these crimes against what is civil, and decent and compassionate, I say again, please look in your heart. You were not born this way. This is unacceptable. Gun violence in Louisville and in cities throughout the country is exacting a human toll that predates COVID-19 and will continue long afterward if we don't pull together as institutions, as families, as individuals, to combine our best efforts to work as one, to try to stop this, to say as one. Enough, enough, when is enough? It's past time. Chief James and Chief Shields and others will speak in a moment, but I will tell you that every agency, every department in Metro government is focused on the challenge of gun violence, on getting weapons off the street, and holding people accountable for these acts of violence. Please know that this is daily, constant commitment of my administration. It is not an easy challenge in cities all over America and in our city right here, and I know that's our focus, is our city, but especially given the limitations placed on us by state laws that ban common sense gun measures. Guns are everywhere and is a huge source of this problem, not just today, but each and every day. We can't do this alone. And on this tragic Wednesday morning, one that claimed another of our young people, I call on our federal partners, our state leaders, and our entire community continue to work toward the same goal of stemming this terrible tide of gun violence. We can do better as a country. We can do better as a state. We can certainly do better as a city. I'm going to be followed by uh, several folks here that will be demonstrating our whole of government response when a tragedy like this uh, takes place. Uh, obviously, LMPD, our federal law enforcement partners, the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods, so people can understand the type of resources uh, that are in place to fight crime, to prevent crime, to intervene before crime takes place, and then the support that's in place when a tragedy like this occurs. So to kick us off, uh, I'd like Chief Erica Shields to say a few words. Chief. Yep. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good morning. We are uh, deeply saddened by the events that occurred this morning at the bus stop. On behalf of LMPD, our condolences go out to the children that were impacted 
their families, the teachers. LMPD immediately started working on gathering information, pulling videos, cameras, um, and putting any and every resource toward this crime, toward solving this heinous crime. We are truly grateful for those citizens who approached us, volunteered information, um, looked in their security cameras to see if there was anything that they could proffer us. This one's a hard one. Um, children are always hard, but um, when it's this senseless and someone's just so, so vulnerable, it's, there's an added level of pain. Um, I've been asked a lot, what are we doing? And I will tell you, we are making arrests daily. We are getting violent felons off the street daily. But as the mayor indicated, the availability of illegal guns is just, it's just so widespread. It's a, it's a difficult curve to get ahead of. Um, we are fortunate in that we don't have to tackle this alone. Since I've come to LMPD, our federal partners have just been absolutely phenomenal. Um, we have officers embedded in different federal agencies, and we have federal agencies embedded with our department. Uh, the FBI and the ATF have been phenomenal, and they have employees who work with us daily. This has been going on since I got here. Uh, the relationship is robust. It's, uh, it's imperative. They have technology. They have resources that we don't have. And there's a recognition that this problem is not going to be solved by one single entity. So um, I, I just want to say thank you to them. I have um, Sean Morrow, who is the head of the ATF uh, in Louisville here, and Ed Gray, who's the head of the FBI. Uh, in Louisville here, and so I want to afford them an opportunity to make comments, but um, it's, this is just a tough day for the city. Well, good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Sean Morrow. I'm the special agent in charge for the ATF Louisville Division. Uh, like everybody standing here today, I'm really devastated to hear about the shooting incident and the really senseless loss of life this morning. Uh, no young person should have to live in an environment where they're afraid of violence. And no community should have to live in fear that their children could be victimized while waiting on a school bus. This morning, ATF special agents and our uh, task force officers responded to the scene to assist LMPD. Together with the ATF Crime Gun Intelligence Center, our special agents and task force officers are assisting LNPD and trying to determine exactly what happened. Our special agents are currently working closely with detectives to identify potential witnesses and to run down any and all investigative leads. Uh, to the extent that evidence is recovered in this case, the ATF National Laboratory will assist LNPD in conducting forensic analysis and will also leverage ATF's National Integrated Ballistic Information Network to try to develop investigative leads and to try to provide any additional federal assistance that the city may need. It's important that we use our time here today to plead with community members to help us in this case. I know the community is outraged. I'm outraged. I saw my own uh, teenage son off to school this morning, and I can't imagine what the families feel like today. To see the justice is served, we definitely need all the community's help. If you have information, please call any of our tip lines. The criminal, when I say criminal or criminals, responsible for this morning's shooting are likely still armed and should be considered dangerous. If you saw something or know anything at all about this crime, call the police immediately. If you or your children overheard something, share that with us. If you live in the area, as the chief said, please review your security cameras for anything unusual. We're asking for any information at all to help us solve this investigation. With that, I'll introduce Ed Gray, Special Agent in Charge with the FBI. Thank you, Sean. Again, my name's Ed Gray. I'm the Acting Special Agent in Charge of the Louisville Field Office of the FBI. Uh, first, as mentioned, I'd like to offer our uh, sincere uh, condolences to the family of the victims 
the children that were there, were there this morning, the teachers, uh, and all those affected by this terrible act. As mentioned before, you know, we at the FBI feel just as strongly that this is a, you know, shouldn't happen at a safe space at, at, a, uh, at a bus stop. Um, it's too early for, for children to, to die and to lose their life, uh, especially through, through gun violence. Um, I'm here for a couple of reasons today. I'm here, first of all, to let you know that, you know, we stand united with LMPD and with the ATF in, in um, combating all violent crime and gun violence here in the city. Uh, as Chief Shields mentioned, we've been here already. Uh, we have additional resources in town from our headquarters division, uh, and, and we've embedded those with LMPD uh, just as recently as last night. Uh, and these activities, you know, will take time to stem violence in the city, but we are committed to doing that. Uh, we live here too. The, the agents that are embedded, the agents with the FBI live in Louisville. Our kids go to school bus stops here as well. And, and we want the violence to end as much as anybody on this stage and, and in the audience. Um, you know, so we're here to, uh, to work with them through a number of task forces, but specifically today I'll talk about the, the violent crime task forces that we're embedded with. Uh, secondly, we have federal jurisdiction on this matter. I mean, gun violence is used. There's a number of things uh, that, that we, we are doing um, to, uh, that, that fall under our purview that we can assist with. As ATF mentioned, FBI also stands ready to assist with laboratory uh, technical um, products and uh, uh, other equipment that we can use to uh, bring to bear in, in this investigation. Um, as, as we do every day with LMPD. Um, lastly, I'll just, uh, you know, thank the public. I know there's people that have already reached out uh, and provided information, and I thank you for that continued support. And, uh, and, and as uh, I'll leave you with another phone number, it's 502-263-6000 uh, or tips.fbi.gov. And it's a plea. I mean, people need to understand that we're serious on our end and we need the public's help. And we ask for that. And uh, video, footage, tips, uh, we'll, we'll cover those leads and we have the resources available to do that. Uh, with that, thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, obviously, JCPS is an enormous partner in our city and our work to keep our children safe and secure. Uh, it's an extraordinarily difficult job to run a school system with 100,000 students and overlay all of the challenges and pressures that come with that. So today is obviously a traumatic day for the entire city, but specifically within JCPS as well. Uh, JCPS works closely with our Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods. Uh, when we have young people that are struggling in our community or young people that are thinking going thinking to go down a life of crime or embedded in that already. Uh, a lot of those kids uh, might be in JCPS, so it's important that we communicate frequently between our Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhood and JCPS, so we're thankful for that relationship as we all work to see all of our kids uh, realize their full human potential in, in our city. So, Dr. Polio, our heart goes out to the entire JCPS team here today. Marty Polio. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, usually I feel that I'm pretty good standing up here and, and with words, but um, I don't know, I'm pretty short on words today um, because it is one of the most difficult mornings, I think, of my career. Um, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years and unfortunately had to go through a lot of student deaths in those 25 years each and every year, but this may be the most challenging of them all. Um, and any time a death of a student is traumatic, especially to the school community, but to the entire JCPS family. But I don't know if I have enough words to talk about the devastation of today. You know, about five minutes, and some others have said this, but about five minutes after my daughter walked out the front door today to go to school is when I got word that this has happened. So you can imagine how devastating that is as a superintendent knowing that one of the students 
in your community has died, especially being shot at a bus station and excuse me, at a bus stop in a drive by shooting is just devastating. But as a father too, as a father where your child is walking out the door, it makes you want to hug your, your child a little closer and know um, that, you know, that's my daughter and the students of JCPS mean so much to me. Um, and so we are here to support the family. Our heart goes out to the family of the victims, especially the one that passed away. I will be contacting the family when the time is appropriate uh, to share um, my condolences and regards. Um, and we will be there to support the schools that are involved in this. So first of all, all the victims from this morning attended Eastern High School. And once again, our hearts are with the families of the victims and all of the students and staff at Eastern High School. I know I've been there before, not this, this same incident, but I've been the principal of a school before with a student death and I know how it impacts the students, the families, the educators of a school community and it can be devastating. We also know that uh, there was a bus stop about a block away uh, for Crosby Middle School, so students um, were at close by. We have sent counselors, uh, crisis counselors, to both Eastern High School and to Crosby Middle School to support students um, of that school. Um, our school bus arrived shortly after the incident, and we know how this impacted all of the students that were there at the bus stop. So this is traumatic for every single student that was at the bus stop, every single student at the school. Um, and within JCPS and our community. And so we, mu we know we must be there for our community. And I have to say this, as I follow the education landscape across America and talk to fellow superintendents and colleagues, the deaths of students, of young people, all across America are happening way too often to gun violence. One is too many, but this is happening over and over. We see the stories daily that are occurring across our nation. And we have to know especially at a bus stop, especially at a bus stop that we consider a safe space all across this community for children just to load the bus and go to school. And so I can't say enough about how important it is that we all work together, the school system, the city, LMPD, our federal partners, to make sure that we, we remove the illegal guns from the street. I can't say that enough. And the proliferation of that over the years has grown immensely. And I think it is critical that we act together to make sure that our children are safe and that no child, again, stands at a bus stop and has to face fear like this. But it is definitely a time for us to come together. We will work to support the family. We'll work to support um, the two school communities and all of JCPS. And I'll finish by saying this, you know, it is a very difficult time for students and staff and families of schools all across America and communities. Dealing with COVID alone has been monumental on schools, from contact tracing and quarantine and sickness and deaths, and trying to keep schools open to add to this, the gun violence is devastating. But we will be working as a community to make sure this does not happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Uh, as I mentioned, JCPS works closely with the, our Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods. You know, frequently people focus on the criminal act and then the law enforcement aspect behind that. Our Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods uh, has many jobs, but chief amongst them is to focus on intervention and prevention uh, so young people don't get involved uh, with criminal activity and understanding the uh, difficult circumstances uh, many young people are born into and how we can make sure that they uh, those kids end up with a good productive and safe life uh, the office for safe and healthy Neighbor neighborhoods has a full team that's in a response mode right now as well so vincent james our chief of community building and dr monique williams our director for our office and for safe and healthy neighborhoods will talk about that chief Thank you, Mayor Fisher, and this day is another day that is, will be recorded as a day of sadness because of what we experienced today. Unfortunately, this is not an unusual day. It reminds me and it calls me back to May 17th, 2012, 
when there was a triple homicide on 32nd and Greenwood and the families and the pain of the community that rippled as a result of that violence is still rippling here in our city today. I remember when walking in this hall eight years ago, talking about the need and the support that was needed for our communities to stop violence. And we start going to work that day and put things in place and begin to look at opportunities to be able to address this senseless violence. And today, we have a team in place to be able to address it in ways we've never been able to address it before and looking at the whole of government because this truly hurts at the core of who we are. There are literally not enough words in the human lexicon to really express how we are really feeling today. Those who love the community, those who are committed to life, those who are committed to the support of our students. The only thing, one thing we can do today is to continue to make a commitment that we're not going to continue to be here at this podium talking about the senseless violence that our young people are experiencing all across this country and in particular what has happened this morning in our very own city. We have an office for safe and healthy neighborhoods that was created in 2013 that just received funding to be able to do the work that it was committed to do some eight years ago. And because of that, we've been able to put in place a response that Dr. Monique Williams, who is the director for the office for safe and healthy neighborhoods is getting ready to talk about because it's about our community. It's about our families. It's about responding to the pain that we all are feeling even now, but in a more significant way, how can we help people, young kids, to move through the trauma of having to experience what they're experiencing today? No child, no parent, no human being should ever have to worry about your child coming home again. No, no, no parent should have to be concerned about my child getting killed at a bus stop. This has to stop in our community. And it's gonna require all of us from law enforcement to the school system, to the business community. This is a call for the entire city to come together just as we came together for the pandemic. This is a federal response, a state response, and a local response. We have to treat this as a pandemic and call this a crisis, a public health crisis, and call it for what it is and respond to it, putting the resources necessary so no more children have to die in our community. I'm tired of having to come to stand before the public and share this information. We need a time in our community and in this, in this space to be able to say no more. In doing that, we have an opportunity with the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods and the work that they've been doing and they're doing today. So I wanna ask Dr. Monique Williams to come forward and share what is happening and how we're responding to it. Thank you. Thank you, Chief James. Um, I mean, what much of what needs to be said has already been said, so I'll briefly um, kind of discuss our response. Uh, it's always a little different when we're responding to an incident where a child is harmed or a child is killed. What we've been doing this morning as an office is really um, mobilizing our uh, Pivot to Peace initiative. And so we have our hospital violence intervention uh, program. We have the community violence interventionists who have been working. And then our focus deterrence response will essentially come later in conjunction with LMPD as more intel comes out. Um, but already, you know, we have our outreach team and workers in partnership with UofL Hospital and Peace Education responding to the youth at the hospital um, and their families to build support around uh, those individuals and to also see what information that we can get from young people for the sake of getting in front of any retaliatory efforts. Right now, um, that is the, the essential crux of the work that we need to do. Um, we have outreach workers that are at Eastern High School, as well as some of the other schools that are impacted, maybe indirectly because there are family members that go to other schools that are associated with some of the children who were involved today. Um, and then we're also working in partnership with um, a Russell Place of Promise to establish a coordinated uh, response for tomorrow to create a healing space really for those who were impacted today in the Russell neighborhood uh, where we will bring together faith leaders, mental health uh, providers, as well as social service agencies to just wrap our arms around community. Um, again, 
be in community, be with community, identify what we need to identify to be able to get in front of the next thing happening. Because unfortunately, when things like this happen, if you don't have an intervention strategy, then you're looking at the next 10 incidents like this happening. Um, so it's critical right now for us to be in intervention mode to uh, ensure that there are no, no retaliatory efforts that can take place, but then also addressing the trauma, which trauma we know also leads to more violence. And so how are we there and showing up in community to support the families uh, and the community that were impacted by um, the events of today? Thank you, Dr. Williams, appreciate that. I wanna recognize that uh, on this year's budget, that started July 1st, you know, we quadrupled the amount of money that was in the non-law enforcement aspect of building a safer community. So uh, the council obviously passed that budget. We were glad to see that pass so that we've got the resources now that we can to help uh, deal with some of these situations in a more robust way. I want to recognize uh, Councilwoman Jessica Green over here, who is the chair of our Public Safety Committee, and we appreciate uh, your work. Metro Council obviously is a critical partner in this effort of keeping our city safe and working together with everybody in a positive manner. And today's tragic shooting happened in the district of Councilman Jacory Arthur. Uh, Councilman Arthur reached out first thing this morning to my office to simply ask, how can I help my city? Uh, that's the same response that came from people in May of 2012 that uh, Vincent James remarked on with the triple homicide there at 32nd and, and Greenwood. People just said, how can I help? And this is a time when people need to look inside and ask themselves that question, everybody, because everybody can do something to help. So, Councilman, I appreciate your leadership in that effort, and if you'd share a few words with us. Councilman Jacory Arthur. You've heard a lot this morning about what we've done. You've heard a lot this morning about what we're doing. I would like to talk about what you can do. But before I talk about that, it's important to hold a mirror up and reflect on city government and elected officials on leadership. Because as we talk about physical violence, we have to understand you will never end the crisis known as physical violence unless you end political violence, unless you end social violence, cultural violence, economical violence, racial violence that has occurred for centuries across this country, across this commonwealth, within our own city. That is incredibly important for us to recognize today because the root causes of all of these incidents have to be addressed. We talk about guns sometimes, and I think to a certain extent, absolutely we need to do something about guns, but I carry a gun every single day and I'm not shooting anyone because my basic needs are met. I use it for the defense, not on the offense. It's incredibly important for us to hold that mirror up and talk about what we need to be doing better, which leads me to what you as community can do, number one, are you involved in some capacity? Whether that's a neighborhood association, whether that's your church, whether that is some sort of political advocacy group, whether it's a social group of friends, are you involved? Are you building power with community? Because the more people you have, the more power you have. And a lot of times you look at people who are considered power holders in the power structure up here on this stage, and you don't realize you as community have more power than we do. Because there's 26 Metro Council members, but there's about 26,000 constituents in each of those districts. How many of those 26,000 plus people are plugged into the work that you're hearing about right now? If this is your first time hearing about the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods, the first time hearing about the responses that they have, that is a problem. You have to plug into the work that is being done. There's no sense in us quadrupling the public safety budget, doubling funding for the Office for uh, Youth Development, doubling funding for um, anything that we're doing if people don't use it, if you don't plug into the work. That's incredibly important. 
What you can also do is hold everybody accountable. Oftentimes we talk about holding elected officials accountable, but I promise if you can't hold your neighbor accountable for, I don't know, cutting their grass or showing up to a community meeting, you will never hold Mayor Fisher accountable. If you can't hold your kids accountable for doing their homework, you will never hold President James accountable. If you can't hold the people who live where you live in your own neighborhood accountable, there's no way in the world you're gonna hold the so-called decision makers and policy makers accountable for the consequences of what happened this morning. Everybody's on this stage drying their tears and talking about how sad they are. And there's a place for being sad, but I'm mad. I'm mad because what we have talked about today is something that we're talking about over and over and over and over. It shouldn't take from 2012 until this budget cycle for us to fully fund an office that is dedicated to preventing violence. That is problematic. So as you watch this, as you engage in what we're talking about right now in this moment, and you're rightfully so very angry, I need you to turn that anger into advocacy because that is the only thing that will incite action. My job is to pass laws. Mayor Fisher's job is to make sure that those laws actually happen. The chief's job is to make sure those laws are enforced. What is your job? Because everyone in Louisville is responsible for Louisville. Thank you, Councilman. Very well said. I'd like to recognize a few other folks here before we uh, take some questions. Uh, Chairwoman of JCPS, Diane Porter, is in the house. We appreciate her good leadership each and every day. Uh, I believe I see Councilman David James here, Councilman Anthony Piangentini. Uh, are there any other council folks here? So thank, th thank them for being here with us as well. So in closing, folks, I mean, you've... Uh, You've heard a lot here this morning, and it is a time to act. Uh, this morning, a student in Louisville was standing, just simply standing at a bus stop and was shot to death, and two others were injured. And please, our humanity demands that we take notice and pause and reaffirm our commitment to ending gun violence. Nobody should die like this, but it does require getting off the sidelines and taking positive action. It is a time to sit with the terrible hurt of this latest homicide, to mourn with a family that is going through an unspeakable loss, and to rededicate ourselves to nonviolent means to deal with unlawful violence. But it is a time to act and to do something positive. Just don't blame, don't deflect, say, what am I doing? Somebody once said that grief is love with no place to go. And my hope is that we, as members of the Louisville family, will use this horrible moment to come together to move to a place where this does not happen and it will not happen again. With that, we're happy to take a few questions. Dr. Pollier gave some details about what happened this morning, but I was wondering before we get into questions, if Chief Shields could give us a rundown of the timeline, basic facts, so we're all on the same page. Chief. So I think, yes, um, the students were at the bus stop. Um, there was a drive-by. Uh, we've given um, a lookout for a vehicle that we really would like the public's help in identifying. We don't know if the person was involved or perhaps witnessed something. So um, PIO Beth Ruff is here. So if your station doesn't have that, please get that. We really, we really want to speak with the driver of that vehicle. Um, I don't have a lot to offer right now. We're still trying to ensure that the appropriate family members have been notified of what's occurred. But really right now, more than anything, my ask of you would to ensure that we're getting out the lookout on that vehicle and uh, that you call 911 if you, if you see it. Uh, we, we don't have that information. We're not aware of that. Well, let's go to the media first. Mayor, you talk about sacred space, safe space, and yet we've had an incident where kids don't feel safe to bus stop anymore. What more can you do that's not being done to, to prevent things like this from happening? It's not an easy question, but... <laughs> wondering what else can be done. 
Well, I mean, clearly there's a, a police response to this. Uh, there's communication through JCPS as well, but this is obviously a vulnerable spot when anybody feels like they're standing uh, on a street corner waiting for a bus in this, in this morning. So we've got to thank Lawrence, take it back before that and ask, you know, why is this violence taking place? Why are young people involved uh, with this in the first place? So that we have families that are involved, knowing what's going on with their kids, uh, whether they're on the shooting end or being shot, so that we can minimize violence in our community that way. We've got to double down on our intervention and prevention work as well. So yeah, you're, what happened today is a symptom of a society that has got a lot of problems with it right now. And there's unfortunately no quick answer to that. But I think from a public safety standpoint, Chief, do you want to offer any comments? So I think uh, the first thing immediately is identifying those areas that we that are in locations where we have incidents of violence and making sure that we are leveraging every piece of technology possible. Um, you're going to see us assessing these locations for the installation of cameras so we can have real time monitoring. Um, you're going to see me and I will I am going to bang this drum loudly, but I am going to be leaning in on the Board of Education. JCPS has to have its own police department. There's no two ways about it. The, the students and the teachers deserve that. And the reality of it is we are, we are dealing with a very difficult gang issue in this city. Many of our gang members go to these schools. They're bust, so they're in different gangs. They're in one gang in the neighborhood. They join a different gang at the schools. And without having dedicated school resource officers who are trained in identifying gang members, identifying potential conflict, having that constant ongoing communication, we are, we are lacking critical intelligence. And there simply has to be the acknowledgement that this, if we don't want to be, to quote Chief James at the podium again, and amen, I don't want to be here again. Well, we can't sit here with our thumbs up our ass, do nothing different, and think we won't be back at this podium. So I can promise you I will be banging that drum loudly because we have to change the paradigm. And the reality of it is there are so many guns. And while I appreciate lawful gun ownership, as Councilman Arthur alluded to, unfortunately, gun ownership does not equate to responsible gun ownership. And I cannot tell you how many guns are stolen on a regular basis from individuals who do not secure their weapons, particularly in their vehicles. When they're stolen and they're easy access for kids, kids break into the car, they get a gun. It's easy money, but it's also our problem. The gun that shot and killed this child today won't have bought, been bought legally. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that and let's do something about that. So I'm not gonna keep coming to the podium and talking stupid. We have to do some things differently. So yes, we will be doing, some, there will be some noise being made because I'm not, this is not okay. We locked up, we had three carjackings last week in a row. We locked up four juveniles this weekend. They all went to Eastern High School. I don't think this child today had anything to do with that. But is there something afoot at Eastern High School? Yes. Do we owe it to the teachers and the students to know what is going on there? We have to empower Dr. Polio so he has a fighting chance. And that's, that's not fair to him. This is a man who's dedicated his life to education. Well, let's help him out. Let's give him and, and, his, and his staff and his educators a fighting chance. So yeah, I'm gonna be making some noise because this is not acceptable and I am tired of burying kids. Well, I'll say this, it's an ongoing issue um, that we've been discussing. Um, we were uh, on course to make a recommendation prior to the pandemic. So we'll be talking about that with our board um, ongoing. I don't, you know, it's hard for us to know right now what, um, until we get more information, whether that would have had an impact on today or not. And then I think secondly, we have to continuously think about the numbers too. I mean, we have 155 schools. Um, and I think with our shortages, and I'm no expert on this on police officers, that can be an issue. But I think it is something we are definitely going to be discussing with our Board of Education and see where they want to go with it.
I, uh, I do not believe Eastern has ever had an, an SRO. That would have been uh, the Middletown Police Department that's there. So um, I'll, I'll confirm that, but I, I do believe that, that that was there was never one at Eastern. And I will say this about SROs. I mean, you know, the common belief is that prior to our board's decision that there were SROs in every school. We had about 28 of them in 2018-19. Um, LMPD was forced to remove about 17 or 18 of those as a result of budget cuts um, and shortage of officers. So really it was going to be down to about 9 or 10 without us staffing our own um, individual department. So that's why we were going that route. Well, I, I mean, I don't know. I can't say. I, I, I'm not going to say that, um, you know, Eastern High School necessarily, you know, the problem is in Eastern High School. I mean, let's be honest. Our, you know, we can't separate community from what happens in our schools. And so because things may be happening in the community, that has, you know, I, I don't believe that's something on Eastern High School um, because, you know, I understand. I understand. But I'm just saying, I believe Eastern High School is a great school. I've been in there many times doing uh, great things with a, a lot of fantastic students in there. Um, but obviously, you know, uh, the kids, the students are impacted by what happens in the community. And I think to Councilman um, Arthur's points, um, when you're talking about students who um, have a lot of need, a lot of trauma, a lot of things that are happening. That happens in the community, and that's not necessarily Eastern High School. Well, I mean, uh, it's a great question. I think it's a community-wide issue. We have 770-plus uh, bus routes, uh, so that means 770 bus stops. Uh, my daughter goes out the door and goes to school, too, so I'm impacted by this as well. Um, so, you know, obviously it's something we're, we're going to work as a community together, but the school system's not going to ch um, simply solve 770 bus stops with community violence alone. We have to be a part of the solution, but that has to be a community-wide solution as well. Somebody had an asked one? Lawrence? You know, the honest answer is I don't, I, I don't spend my days politicking. I spend my days trying to make the community safe. I put forward what I see as an issue. I rely on those individuals who are in the room here, the council folks, the state legislatures to hear us, respond to us. But if you're asking me if I'm going uh, to the state capitol and pitting myself against the Republican Party no because I don't think that that's the issue I think that that's but I think that I don't I think that you have you have Democrats who who equally don't think the gun laws are an issue and you know I'll be honest with you I think for me from where I'm standing the two things that would help me the most are if people secured their weapons didn't just leave them in their car and if the judges held individuals who possessed guns illegally accountable. The judicial system has escaped scrutiny for far, far too long. And I cannot tell you how many times we are locking up people who are felons in possessions of weapons over and over and over. So I think from where I'm standing, why am I fighting for stricter laws if we are incapable of enforcing the laws that we have now? Uh, yes, the third student was grazed, I believe, in the ankle, but yes, three. Two 14-year-olds and one 16-year-old. The 16-year-old is deceased. Yeah.